Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Shane Squark, and on behalf of the Market Technicians Association, I'd like to welcome you to another webcast as part of the MTA's educational web series. Today, March 30th, 2011, we're joined by Jeff Greenblatt as he presents Harnessing Explosive Turns Using GAN. Jeff Greenblatt is the author of Breakthrough Strategies for Predicting Any Market, editor of the Fibonacci Forecaster Newsletters, director of Lucas Weave International, LLC, and a private trader for the past 10 years. He is also a regular contributor to the Futures Magazine, your trading editor in Australia, and educated analyst. He has appeared on 1510 KFNN Financial News Radio in Phoenix, Arizona. Jeff speaks at conventions around the country, including conferences where Lifetime Achievement Awards were given to Martin Pring and Dick Arms. As always, we welcome your questions throughout the presentation. However, in the interest of time, we will not be able to get to them until the very end. As a reminder, your participation in this webcast today will be worth one MTA continuing education credit. If you register online to the MTA website, the credits will automatically be added to your account. Otherwise, we ask that you simply fill out the self-reported credit form from your member profile. And without any further ado, from sunny Arizona, I give you Mr. Jeff Greenblatt. Shane, thank you very much. I am very honored to be talking for the uh, MTA. It's, uh, it's a bigger honor than you can imagine. So I have a special presentation planned for you guys today. And uh, we have a lot of material to cover, so we might as well just get started. So it's the Market Technicians Association. I think the main topic is technical analysis, right? Technical analysis is different things to different people. But what it is to me mostly is pattern recognition. That's the number one thing on the top of the list. It's not a bunch of uh, uh, indicators, lagging, into all kinds of indicators. The idea here is that in my trails, traders lose money because they get emotional. And this will go for investors too, anybody. They get emotional because they don't understand the pattern. Now, if you, and if you don't understand the pattern, you're going to make emotional mistakes. So logically, if you can come to understand the pattern, you're going to have greater opportunities to make money. And likewise, you will miss these emotional mistakes that sap the bankroll. Now, as, uh, as Shane told you, I did get an opportunity to speak at a conference where Dick Arms got a Lifetime Achievement Award, and it warmed my heart that he actually has the exact same opinion of technical analysis and pattern recognition that I do, and he believes that all fear and greed is built into the pattern. And so if you don't want to take everything that I say verbatim, think in the back of your mind that Dick came before us and I'm like one of his little disciples and I'm proud to be that. And I used to be known as the Fibonacci guy. And we've, you know, if those of you who have seen my first book know uh, that we basically took Fibonacci re retracements and turned them in, in, in numbers, and we had uh, windows, and we would see turns that would come from the windows. Now, I didn't invent that. I mean, it was, uh, I learned that from the Elliott Wave people, but I think I, in, in, the, in the years I've been doing this, I've taken it to a different level. But the thing with Fibonacci, really, is it was once the domain of elite traders. It's popularized now by media outlets. I mean, if you guys listen to the Fast Money Show in the afternoon, you're going to see that they talk about this Fibonacci level and that Fibonacci level. It's great for them, but once the masses get a hold of it, it's no longer cutting edge. So our approach is to always be cutting edge. So instead of thinking that Fibonacci retracements and the like are cutting edge, it's our foundation and where others end, this is where we start. So what we're going to cover today, obviously, is pattern recognition. We're going to get into cycle work and symmetries. We're going to talk about price and time ratio squares, percentage change readings, which I think uh, 9 out of 10 people overlook, and they shouldn't. I mean, it's a simple thing uh, to think of from point A to point B to see if there's a percentage change reading that works. We're going to talk about pitchfork lines, support and resistance, range squaring the time. I'm going to sneak in some current situations, time permitting, and how you can profit from this data. 
And so as we begin, the time work is the miss, it, I think it's the missing X factor to most people. Time windows can be anticipated in advance, but it is a, a double-edged sword. I mean, it, on the one hand, we know that a certain window is going to come, a market can turn, but we want to make sure that it does turn. If, if you get nothing else out of this presentation today, I don't want you to, to leave here thinking, oh, Jeff told me that the market could turn at 144 or 233 and 61, and I'm just going to go out and uh, go ahead of the turn and, and, and reverse. We want to see evidence that there is a turn. But this does eliminate the need for lagging indicators, and you can anticipate before you act in advance. Now, in my work, we had a 262-week pivot at the top back in 2007. I had told people about this pivot that was coming. It was one of the, I thought it could be the most important pivot of the decade, and perhaps I'm wrong because the top may have been the most important pivot of our lifetime. And this is exactly what it looked like. This is the bull market from uh, the, the bottom in 2002 to the October 11th in 2007. It was exactly 262 weeks. Now, as we were getting close towards the end, what you're looking at here is a common Fibonacci relationship. And what, I'm, and this is, you're, what you're looking at is the Russell 2000. The Russell 2000 happened to be an index that, that topped in July of 2007. It topped early. And what you're looking at is your common ABC, where A is 60% of the, uh, the C wave. It's a common Fibonacci relationship. But what, what I advocate is looking at this one level deeper. And the bottom line is if you, if you really look at this closely, what you'll see is that this ABC is from the, uh, from the July high to the October high, which lined up perfectly with the Dow on, at, in, on October 11th, 12th, is that you'll see that that ABC is 55 and a half calendar days out of 90 days from July, which, in, according to time, is a 61% time retracement. Now, I don't want you to, you know, start thinking every single time you've got to look at the time retracement because if you're trading, you don't want to overthink this thing, but I want to get you guys in the habit of thinking one level deeper. And that's, this is just the calculations from that particular chart. And yeah, it was a 61% time retracement. Most people think of, time retra think of retracements according to price. And so the most important rule that we have, and it's not my rule, this is Gann's rule, when price and time square, the trend changes direction. Remember that. And there's many manifestations of it. And one of the manifestations that we use is ratio work. A ratio dictates when we are close to or at a turn. And we also use per percentage change readings. Why this is important, as I tell people uh, in my first book, we used to have, uh, we used to look at turns that would happen in 61 days or 144 or 161. And the bottom line is, is that all these windows are, are elective, pit, uh, they're forks in the road for the market. We don't know if the market is going to turn at one of these windows, but when we put a ratio, when we take the number of points and divide by the, 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 the number of bars, we get a ratio, and we can get a feel for how strong that pivot is going to be. And the ratio work happens to be according to a, a Fibonacci number or a Lucas number or a, a golden spiral number. You guys will recognize most of these numbers from Fibonacci work. Um, I'm credited as one of the guys that brought Lucas back to the forefront in, 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 this, in the business that it's, you know, I, I didn't invent Lucas numbers. There was people that came before me, but I gave, I, I said, you know what? Lucas numbers are a little bit more important to this game than people realize. And so you can get turns based on Lucas numbers. We're also looking at GAN numbers. Uh, if, if those of you who are into geometrics will recognize those are very important numbers. 
Here's some more important numbers. We use sacred geometry numbers. We use uh, multiples of 144. We use the astronomic numbers are taken off the NASA tables. And so the market basically talks to us in a language of numbers if we'll only listen. So what we're basically doing with these numbers is dividing the number of points into the number of bars and uh, the, to get a ratio. And the, the, the ratio is going to give us some kind of an idea of how important a pivot could be. And we are also using percentage change reading. So let me give you an example of this. This, the next slide I'm going to show you is the, uh, the Russell Bear Bottom. It's one of the best examples of percentage change readings that I've ever seen, but it was only part of the story, as you'll see. So if you take a close look at this slide, what you're going to end up seeing is the complete Russell bear market. It dropped 60%. And if we take the ratio of 513 points and divide it by 415 and a half days, we end up with an average point per day drop of 1.23. And that's what I mean by a ratio. We're looking for a specific number in our language and what ends up happening, and most people don't realize this, is that when a trend completes, you will have a perfect number of points per day or points per hour to show the completion of the trend. And taking this one step further, most people don't realize this, but when we look at the, you know, when we break down the, the Russell uh, bear market bottom, you'll see that from top to bottom that was 60%, which is close to 61.8. But from the secondary high, and you guys will remember there was a bear market rally in the summer of 2008, that dropped exactly 55%, and you'll recognize that as a Fibonacci number. Now, what you Elliotticians out there will call the fourth wave, if you look at that little peak before the end, it was 33.99%. They had to mess me up by one, what, one hundredth of a percentage point. It's like, okay, so the bottom line is, by the time the Russell bear market ended, we were down 60% from the top, 55% from the secondary high, and 34% from the fourth wave high. And all of this clustered at the exact point in the March 2009 bottom. And this is one of the reasons that I was able to go to people and say, you know what, this bottom is very significant because we don't see these kind of calculations very often. And there was lots of technicians out there who were thinking that that bottom was going to be taken out in short order or they were looking for that thing to be taken out. Every time the market turned in the early phases of the rally, and I go, you know what, this is a significant low. And so now we're going to take this one step further. Uh, topping and bottoming is a process. And this is the, the, what I want you guys to understand is something called range and price squaring. This is the 1987 Dow crash wave. It topped at um, 2746. Bottoms at 1638. The range is 1108 points, roughly. Now we project out from that August 1987 top. We go to the NDX bottom of uh, November 21st, 2008. And get, folks, guess how many weeks that was? You get three guesses, and the first two don't count. So you had a range of 1,108 points on that Dow drop, and it spanned 1,108 weeks until the NDX bottomed. So if you start thinking about that NDX bottom at 1100, with the 1,108 sequence, and then you start combining it with the Russell 2000 the percentage change readings that I showed you, and you've got something fairly significant there. The reason that we're showing you this now is yes, this is stock market history, but the point is, is that this is the champagne Rolls Royce of pivots, and you take every pivot that you see, and it's compared to the, you know, it's compared to the textbook, 
and most of them aren't going to be as strong, but if you, if you take to this type of methodology, you will start to get a feel for what kind of readings and calculations make a better pivot as opposed to not. And so this can even be applied to intraday trading. We use price and time squares. Um, the best situations do cluster with support and resistance. You should always be aware of the, the larger daily cycles. Percentage change readings, I would say, are less important on intraday charts, just so you know that. Now let's take this Russell 2000 move. Now this is the, uh, this is the, uh, the E-mini. It's an intraday chart. I believe this is a 15-minute chart. You have your common, you'll see you have your common ABC down that everybody knows. But where do you get the conviction? Because the point being is that you had a 3.1 point move in exactly 31 bars. So you have a perfect one-to-one -one relationship. Now you might say, well, Jeff, why is it that we don't get a 31 point move in 31 bars? Gee, thank God that we don't. Because, you know, we don't want to see these big 31-point moves in 31 bars on the Russell. And, you know, it's, I don't think it's good for your nerves. So what we do is manipulate the decimal point to relate it to the particular chart that we're working with. And if the numbers line up, then you know you have really good symmetry. For instance, you know, we have a, we, we, we have a Dow with five digits. We have a NASDAQ with four digits. We have futures markets with... Uh, three digits to the right of the decimal point, and we have four digits to the right of the decimal point of Forex, but the concept is the same. And just to give you some kind of an idea how this works, here's some more Russell 2000 uh, work on a 15-minute chart. You take 10 points, 55 and a half bars, you do the math, and you'll find that for this complete move, each uh, bar completes in point one eight zero points per each bar and that's where that move completed so like in the first book what we were discussing are, are were fibonacci windows we're looking at 55s and 144s and 233s and when we break down the symmetry and the ratio you'll find that you can find opportunity in just about any set of numbers it doesn't necessarily have to be Fibonacci numbers. However, the best uh, opportunities do present themselves in Fibonacci and geometric GAN type numbers. And just to go over a, a little bit more of this, um, what we have here is a 38% retracement. It's a common 38% retracement. You guys are all familiar with this. But what you have is an 8.4 point move in 18 and a half bars, you do the math, you'll find that the move completes in a point forty-five reading, which means it moved point forty-five points for every bar. Those are the kinds of readings that you could recognize that create significant turns. Now, how do you trust a, a retracement? You give it a great square reading. And the reason that we're doing, that I do this work, that... I teach people to do this this kind of work is I speak to traders all the time when I was in New York and I and I gave a presentation over there I asked people in your trading are you in a syndrome where you win a few and lose a few and never get that far ahead and like 75% of the hands in the room went up well the reason that is is people are not aware of how to uh, pick out a higher quality setup. The reason why you want to get a higher quality setup is that you can be convicted about a move, and not all pivots are created the same, and if you could get the higher quality moves, you're going to put yourself in a position where you can allow your winners to run. And so this, is the, this one is just more of the same. You've got a move that retests support, uh, six and a half point move in 25 bars, 0 0.26260 reading. You guys will recognize that as 0 0.261. So we're going to move on, and I'm sure you guys are familiar with uh, with Fibonacci extension work. And how do we confirm that that's a good high? And look at the look at the high, and look how the move explodes to the downside. 
Why does it explode to the downside? Because the underlying internals here, you have a 2.618 extension of that last little leg down, but on the move up, it averages 0.359, which is you know close to 360, which in, in GAN terminology is a complete circle. That's a very good reading. So when we combine your common Fibonacci work with the readings, you get very explosive moves. And I think that was the, the title of our presentation today, which is what, Harnessing Explosive Moves Using GAN? This is how you do it. And I don't know how many of you guys are aware of it, but when we, when we get to certain Fibonacci numbers like 610 and 618, these, are, these act as price magnets uh, for the pattern, and uh, they do create natural support and resistance lines, and you guys should, should just be aware of this. And there's even a good reading on that high, and it, it, it had another explosive move. Now, one thing that we did cover about in, in, in my newsletter, there was a uh, there, there there was a sequence in the U.S. dollar. This was not this was 2009, where this this very complicated pattern it reached a point where it, it, it sold off the beginning of June. It started going sideways, and it did a triangle. And what ended up happening is that 360 hours off the low, prices averaged 0 .0061 points per hour, and that was the exact end of this triangle. It was tested two or three times in, at the end of June and the beginning of July. It never took it out, and it just the dollar just absolutely crashed from that point until November 2009. But this is why it happened. So some of the key points to remember here is that what I've showed you is the underlying structure of all markets. We no longer need things like RSI, Stochastic, and MACD. You should never front run the bars. You should always wait for the change. And basically, if you get nothing else out of this presentation and you're real excited about using these time windows, basically what as a trading strategy, what you want to do is get a reading, get a, a support or resistance line, and see it get confirmed by a candlestick formation. You get those three components in place, and you have a very high probability turn. Now, if you want to get creative, these are, these are just out of, out of my research over the past couple of years. This was September 2009, I believe, where we had a sequence of natural gas, which we all know was in a horrible, horrible bear market where this, the, the reading was 0.429 points per day in 429 calendar days. And from there, and that's, these are the calculations. I'm not really going to spend a lot of time on this, but it, it, this is calculated out perfectly. It was also 61 weeks down at that point. But what, look at the follow-through from that. That was uh, up to that point. It was one of the best counter-trend bear market rallies that Nat Gas has had in its entire sequence of being a bear market. And where did it top? Well, it topped uh, about six weeks later when the daily square reading was 0 0.0619. So one reading led to the next, and then we were back in the bear market again. And then I believe you had a one-to-one -one relationship down at that particular low, and it bounced again, and it just kept going down. Anyway, last year we had a major top in sugar, and sugar uh, had a, a – you, you, those of you who follow commodities know sugar have fell, and why did it fall? I mean, you could think that there was some fundamental reason for it, but as technicians, I look underneath the, uh, the surface – the bottom line is is that the, the current trend was up 318 days, and there's nothing uh, rare or strange about that unless the entire trend was also up 317 weeks. Now, everything that we've discussed up to this point is plus or minus one, so you have a slight margin for error. So here we had a situation where the current intermediate trend in sugar was up 318 days, 
and the larger degree trend going on a on a weekly continuation chart was up 317 weeks, and the net result was that sugar absolutely crashed from that high. Now, we have a similar situation working right now in the precious metals. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to crash. But the reason that the reason I'm showing this to you guys, simply put, is every time something significant happens, like what I've shown you on the sugar chart, I make a mental note of it in my catalog of patterns. That it's a it's a the kind of calculation you want to watch out for in the future because risk is going to be high. The bottom line here is that. The recent turn last week in the XAU is that it was 608 trading days off the um, the August, um, no, the October 2008 bottom. Gold, and this is the cash chart, back to the 1999 bottom is now up 610 weeks. And before I get emails from you guys, I'm counting the, uh, if you look on a cash chart on gold, depending upon the data supplier that you have, uh, there, there's different numbers. The one that I use actually has the July 99 as the low. Some of you will come back and say that it was August of 99. There's a discrepancy in the tick, the tick data all these years later. The bottom line that, that I'm going to say to you guys is that there's a double bottom in July and August of 1999, and here we are where the XAU is up 608 days in the current trend and gold is up 610 weeks. You'll recognize 610 as a Fibonacci number. And the calculations that I did last night does not project to a crash. It does project to some kind of a sideways pattern. So that's the current situation in precious metals. Now, one of the reasons that I really got fascinated by all of this is a couple of years back I was looking at a potash chart, and it peaked out at price point to handle at 121 in 121 days, and it created this incredible uh, shorting opportunity, and I started thinking about this, and uh, it inspired the ratio work because you're not going to see situations like potash materialize like this every day. But as I've just shown you, you can take any leg. I don't care if it's a five-minute chart, an hourly chart, a daily chart, or a weekly chart on any chart and get some kind of a ratio. And these ratios, given our three components, are going to give you opportunities that you may pass by otherwise. So we're getting creative. I'm going to show you another situation that we had in corn at the time. It, uh, it was, this is September 2009. It bottomed out at, at, at the 302 handle at 302 trading days. There was also a secondary calculation to that, that it was 262 uh, days from the secondary pivot and 383 points. You'll recognize 14.6 uh, uh, ratio, uh, Fibonacci ratio that was average 1.46 points per day on, on that calculation. That created a nice bear market bounce in corn at the time. Not the trend that we're in now, but a year earlier. And so that basically explains where, you know, where, where that was coming from. And going back, you, you might be wondering, well, gee, Jeff, does this stuff work just in the 21st century? Well, if we go back uh, to in time, we go back to um, the Great Depression, for instance. If you do the math, what you'll find is that the bear market from the top in 1929 to the 1932 crash was an 89% Fibonacci drop, and for every day of that trend, it averaged 2.326, which rounds to 2.33 points per day, which makes what I'm showing you timeless. It worked, in, it worked 80 years ago. It's probably going to work 80 years from now. So we don't have to go back 80 years. We can go back 30 years to the 1980 silver top where we have similar calculations. You'll see that this particular leg was down 78.55% on a monthly chart that equates to 78.6% retracement. And uh, if we take the, day, the points and the number of days, you'll see that it averaged, what, 45 
Uh, it was a 45 reading. We take the same case study and we take it, we, we expand a little bit. You'll find that the, that the first leg was down 78.5%. The whole move down was down 90%. And uh, for 127 weeks, it averaged almost a perfect 36 points a week. So you can you can start to appreciate the kind of symmetry that's involved in completed patterns. And here you had a low in silver from the early 80s that this pivot lasted nine years. And so when I think of the champagne level of pivots, I always go back to the Russell 2000 and I always go back to this silver chart as two of the best that I've ever seen, plus, of course, the 1932 bottom. And that's just a larger degree view, so you can get some kind of a feel for what happened there. In any event, uh, markets are spiraling in all degrees of trend. What I'm doing is taking snapshots of these point in times. We're looking for uh, opportunity, basically, in all the different readings and uh, the corn, the nat gas, the POT, the potash, it's rare, but they're important for you to understand that these are what the best readings look like. And if you see them, like if you're trading the E-mini market and you see 3.1 drop in 31 bars and all of a sudden you get a morning star pattern, you should jump all over that. That's what you should take from this section. So with that, now we're going to move on to median lines because I don't think that cycle work is uh, the end all be all. I don't think that number. I don't think we should be a slave to the numbers. I think that the numbers are basically a tool for us. And uh, the number one thing is understanding what goes on on the chart. Uh, everything is um, is is on the chart. Uh, this, uh, I believe that support is demand. Uh, Resistance is supply, but uh, check this out. There's a five-minute Dow E-mini, and if you just look at this, you're probably not going to understand very well what this pattern is doing or what it can be doing. But when we put the pitchforks on it, you could see there's you could see there's perfect symmetry to it, and you could totally understand the pattern. You could see that we were in an aggressive downtrend. And it hit a confluence of uh, of lines at the low, and it bounced, and uh, it, it it was it, it was a magnet to the to the midline, and it pulled back to the support line. Look at that one more time. Unclarity, good clarity. That's why I believe in the pitchfork lines. And what we basically do is combine the pitchfork lines. With the other work, and this is a very long-term uh, look at the U.S. dollar. Why has it topped where it has over the past few years? Well, if you put the ginormous pitchfork on it, what you will see is a resistance midline that has been tagged three different times in the last decade, and it repelled the action each time. Now, if you put the pitchfork line on it, you may come to understand the pattern a lot more than if you don't. And a little advanced pitchfork uh, terminology, methodology, is we put, this is the banking uh, chart. This is the bottom and the end of the bear market in the BKX, and you will see that when we put the, the parallel warning lines on there, it gave us a perfect bottom. So basically what we're doing is we're taking a normal customary pitchfork and extending the lines out and uh, these are a magnet to the price action. Last year, you guys will remember the flash crash. We put the parallel warning lines on the flash crash. This happens to be a, an intraday chart of, of the NDX. You will see how closely the uh, parallel warning lines came to na helping navigate the bottom. And there's a lot of people that had a lot of trouble with that, um, with that exact, you know, pattern. But to make a long story short, I'm sure you guys all heard about the fat finger theory and my friend Collins over at Futures Magazine. 
he called me up and he wanted to know what I thought about the whole thing. And so what I always, because people thought it was that it wasn't real, that there was some kind of a technical mistake or whatever it was. So I ran the numbers and I ran, you know, I put the pitchforks on it, saw that there was perfect symmetry, and I said, you know what, this thing's perfect. This thing is right, it's real, it is what it is, and that's the way it is. And that's the proof of it. And I, just what you should take out of this section is that parallel warning lines are excellent tools for catching tops and bottoms of long-term trends. You'll see that this is the commodity crash in the oil market. You'll see how the parallel warning lines almost perfectly caught the top and the bottom. And basically what we're doing on this chart is we're taking the, a, a, a confluence of pitchfork lines, we're putting the readings on it so we can get a good idea if the particular uh, magnet line of the pitchfork is going to confirm. And um, the bo this this is um, to, from last week. We're sneaking in some current action. This is the uh, the uh, EUR USD, and you you guys know that that's been on an incredible rally and. So what ended up happening is that when it hit the high end of the pitchfork, there was a GAN reading uh, there, and we're not going to get into the to the internals of the GAN reading right now, but when the GAN reading hit on the day that it hit the pitchfork, the trend changed. That's what you should take from this. And not only did the trend change, but when when, when these pitchfork lines are hit, the trend changes, sentiment changes too. The next day, we learned that there was a problem in Portugal. So the bottom line is, is that the underlying internals of the price action, as expressed by the pattern, does its thing, and then the news event materializes. And so the reason I do the pitchforks, because it's an excellent form of support and resistance, but I'm also a firm believer in the polarity principle. And if you're not familiar with the term, you're probably familiar with the idea that former support can become resistance and former resistance can become support. I live by this credo. And my research has also, uh, ex I've extended that. I've gone back 80 years and I've looked at what, and, and I, what I call the A-wave tendency. Now, you Elliott Wave people will appreciate this, is because what I found, and it makes a lot of sense if you think about, you Elliott folks, if you think about the fourth wave overlap rule, is that if we look at the first leg down or the A wave down, and that in this case it became support, finally broke, comes back up, becomes resistance, and it leads to tremendous drop. And that's really... If you look at the first drop down, what, it is, what is it? It's really a big A wave and a gigantic ABC. Now, this is one going the other way. You'll see you've got a little A wave off the bottom, pulls back, eventually takes it out, comes back, retests it, and explodes higher. This is a tendency that you will see on and on and on throughout stock market history. And so to prove the polarity point, it, it, you, you have that A wave off the low, pulls back, and it doesn't always, it's a, the polarity point is, in this case, it ended up being an acceleration point that if you look at the extreme right of the screen, you'll see where it gapped up. But if you look at the, the left part from the high to the first leg down, you'll see once again, A wave down, it bounces off that point, it fails, it comes off the low, it retests it, polarity fails, comes back down, comes back to the exact line, and finally gaps through it. So you should have some kind of a idea and recognize how important this tendency really is. And here you have a, you've seen smaller A waves off the high. The same principle works. You've got uh, the A wave down, retests it, fails, retest it again, and then you have this really big move to the downside. So now what ends up happening is you add a pitchfork to an A wave, and then you're really cooking with gas. 
because now you're getting two forms of resistance in not exactly the same place, but in the general area of the same place. And you'll see as it comes back to retest that horizontal line that leads to the most explosive move of the entire sequence. But where does it bottom? It bottoms at the bottom of that pitchfork, doesn't it? And I know that I'm preaching to the choir here with you guys and at the MTA, but I go over this anyway. Uh, one of my one of my hobbies is a study of mastery, and the idea being is that it's usually the people with the heart and the persistence will beat natural talent all the time. Well, they've done any number of studies. I could have come here with ten studies, but I only came here with one or two. One of the most famous ones is the Gardner study where they studied musical savants. These are children at age of two that had perfect pitch, and they did a control group where they compared it to young children that had access to good training and a supportive environment and the conclusion was that by the time both groups were adults, the kids that had the environment and the training and the persistence outperformed the kids with the born talent. So the, the bottom line is, is that these kids, ne the, 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 the ones that were born with perfect pitch tended to neglect their talent and they never attained excellence as adults. So you could see the different studies that have been involved here throughout time that confirm this. Now, why am I telling you this? And I'm sure, once again, I'm preaching to the choir, but the bottom line is, is that what I'm showing you here, I know you're not going to digest it in one sitting, but if you have the passion and the motivation and uh, you have the, the, the access to the right equipment, uh, there's no, there, the, the sky's the limit. And why do we study the underlying structure of markets? Because, as I told you earlier, many traders have a syndrome of win a few, lose a few, and the only way to win is to understand why you're winning, and if you're not doing that, then you're gambling. Because anybody can put on a winning trade, but if you don't understand why it's happening, then you're just uh, opening yourself up to chance. And the idea is to use a coaching uh, uh, analogy, uh, the coach always wants to put his players in a position where they can win the game. You want to put yourself in a position where you're in a winning situation, and the only way you could do that is develop a conviction about a move. The only way you can do that is by selecting higher quality moves. So with that, we're going to get to the, to the highlight of the presentation today, to Gann's most important discovery, <laughs> which he believed that history repeats itself. The past is the best predictor of future moves. So I'm going to show you squaring of price and range and time. Basically what it is is we take an equal number of points balancing an equal number of time periods. And uh, in the modern era, as I've already shown you in an example with uh, the XAU and gold and with the Dow and the NDX, the bottom line is, back in the day, Gann only had to deal with the Dow. He didn't have to deal with the S&P 500. He didn't have to deal with, or maybe the S some S&P 500, but he didn't have to deal with a NASDAQ and an NDX, and he didn't have to deal with a housing sector and a banking sector. All of this stuff is very related to each other, and it makes markets more complex. But uh, the idea being... And I'm going to show you the exact same chart again. Here's the Dow range. You guys already saw this chart, 1,108 points. Uh, the NDX, it's not the Dow, right? It's the NDX. So there's a, you, there's a relationship there between similar indexes that are not the same. Dow top, NDX bottom, 1,108 points, 1,108 weeks. It's complex, but it's, the, the idea is simple. Now, how do we leverage our in information? Back at the, the bottom in 2009, the, the bank's bottom, and this is, you're looking at April 2010, where we had the banking index peaked 
at the 5881 handle in 59 weeks. Now, why is this information important? Well, number one, it's outstanding symmetry. But number two, if you see this symmetry on a very important chart like the banks, then you can leverage the information to have an idea of what the whole market's going to do. So the idea is that, yeah, I agree that this is, you know, somewhat complex work, and you don't have to do this on all these charts, but if you could find a, a, a leading sector, like as we know, the, uh, the subprime mess led the, you know, led the bear market down. Now, if you could find an important sector like the banks to give you this kind of symmetry and, it's, and the banks start leading, then you could start developing the conviction to realize that something important is happening and there's a change taking place and you'll have an edge over everybody else. Now we're going to get to a little bit more fun work. This is uh, how you could recognize this stuff in, an, in ordinary trading. What I showed you on the banking chart basically is how you come to leverage this information to understand important trends in the market. This stuff on the, on the charts of individual stocks happens, I won't say happens every day, but it does happen often enough that all you need is a couple of these a month to make some serious money. The bottom line here for Amgen is that from the low to the high, back to that low, at the bottom of the pitchfork, see how we're combining different methodologies? We had 65 trading days. Now, the bottom line here is from the high to the low, we had a range of $6.55 at 65 trading days at the bottom of the pitchfork. So I'm sure you'll agree that this is the kind of setup where you should get excited and develop conviction and realize that, oh, that, that you're, you want to be in something where a winner can run. Now, in a case like this, your, tar, your, your entry is obviously down at when you see these things materialize and you get a good uh, candle reversal pattern. But what's your target going to be? Basically, your target's going to be what the pitchfork tells you it's going to be. And uh, you could see that that basically went all the way up to the top of the range. Now, at that particular time, it went a little bit beyond that, but that was more or less the extent of that particular trade. And by no means is that uh, a standalone thing. But once again, why was this important? Well, that, that 655 sequence happened around the 1st of December, and Amgen, being a leading stock in the biotech, gave a signal that it was ready, that, that a change was taking place. So you think about this for a minute. Amgen, leading stock, has a good reversal, and it's in a leading sector like the biotech, and the biotech has a very strong influence on, on the NDX. This was the exact signal to show us that the Santa Claus rally was getting ready to get cranked up. And you can see what happened there on the biotech. And you could see at the low exactly where we found that Amgen set up. Now, this is a case study in RIM. Happened, I believe this was also in December. Um, the, the, first, the first low here at congestion, was, the price point was $55.49 at 55 trading days. And then what ended up happening, it rallied and peaked at 63.94 at 64 days. And we take it one step further at the 64 sequence. It sold off to the midline. And at that midline, the drop ended. And uh, take a guess how, what the range was on the drop. It was $6.46, and it rallied again. Now, I know everybody likes a penny stock. Maybe, uh, you know, I, I shouldn't advocate speculating, but we know that that's the heart of the market. In this particular case, this is a biotech that had a .42, 42 cent correction of 41 days. Look what happened. Pretty amazing, isn't it? And then uh, another one was Celgene. This one's a little bit more complicated but it hit a price point of $60.90 in 61 and a half days off of the high. You'll see that in the middle. Uh, it hit the midline, perfect uh, symmetry, 
And what ended up happening is that thing really sold off. And if I'm not mistaken, the high on that was close to 64, and that bottomed in 64 days. So you could see that what I'm showing you is not an isolated incident. It's not lightning striking once. You can find these things on a regular basis. Last September, we had a situation in the Dow. If you do the math on the Dow, you'll see that it was a 7,700 uh, range on the bear market, but the first week of September was 77 weeks off the low, and that's where the market turned up, and that was why that you know, that gave us the conviction to realize that September wasn't just a little bounce, it was a little bit more significant. And so here's where we are right now. This is the long-term pitchfork channel on the S&P 500. We broke through it in February, we fell back down, right now we're sitting above it, and, and I will tell you guys, that breaking through it here and there, it doesn't mean much, but if, this, if the S&P 500 is going to set up shop north of this channel line, the bear, you could consider the secular bear market to be over. And that's what I want you to take from this chart. I mean, people go on TV and they're guessing. Oh, is the bear market over? Yes, it is. No, it isn't. And they don't know, but this is concrete proof. And the other thing is, is uh, we know the tragedy happened in Japan. It's a terrible humanitarian tragedy. We know the market crashed after that. But how many of you folks realize is that the crash happened and the bottom materialized on the 232nd trading day off of last year's high? You know, Japan did not go on to make new highs above last April like our markets did. It's kind of like banking and housing that it never did you know, take out that high. But what ended up happening is that the crash stopped going down in the 233-day window. If you look at the, the – this, this picture was snapped a couple of days ago. Yesterday the action was positive, and it's turned up. And if you also took notice – You'll also see that, the, that after this window, after this 233-day cycle hit, everything in the market changed. So this is very significant. So I know we've only covered so much. Uh, I do offer a training program where we get in greater detail, where we cover the material that we did today plus the square nine, plus other stuff. We have a one-week special if you go to the Lucas Wave International website, basically what you get is uh, email correspondence from me and three one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions. And if you don't want to do that, if you're a rugged individualist, I've, made a, I've put together a manual of the training program, and you can see exactly what that covers. And uh, if you go to the Lucas Wave International website, and click on the, uh, the button on the right side of the screen. It's the PayPal button. You can get that. You, you, that's for rugged individuals who, don't, who, who want to work it at their very own pace and don't want to uh, be accountable to me or uh, and do the homework assignments from me and do it on your own. That's what's available, and that's where you can get more information. And with that, uh, Shane, that's pretty much it. And Shane has some questions for me, and we have a question from George. How do you pick points to use for your pitchfork? Well, we basically, what, what, I basically use the, 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 the customary, uh, the custom points for the most part is that we use in, let's just say, let's call it Elliott terms. You use the, the you use the low, if, if it's, if it's a bottom, we, I, I basically use the, the third wave low, the fourth wave high, and the bottom. Or if it's on a high, we so we, the bottom line is we use the low next to the bottom and the high next to the bottom. And if you reverse that, basically what we're doing is we're using the uh, the high next to the high next to the top and the low. So third wave high, fourth wave low, fifth wave top, 
and that points us in a new direction. And uh, let's see, the question from using your BKX chart, when will the banking sector bottom? Well, you're asked, I don't, I'm not exactly sure I understand the question, but um, the ba- all I can tell you right now about the banking sector is that it did not lead to the upside uh, in the recent rally phase. It didn't, it's not leading to the downside, or I should say in the recent last month it did not lead to the downside, and right now it's not leading to the upside. But what, I, but what you should realize about banks is if we go back to the 1970s, uh, make a long story short, the real bottom is recognized as 1974 and 1975, and that was uh, the markets climbed the wall of worry. You'll remember that was before, uh, the, before Jimmy Carter, before gas lines, before the uh, Iran hostage crisis, and 20% interest rates and misery rate and, and, and the misery index. Yet the market was never retesting that low. So make a long story short, banks have maybe have bottomed. And what I'm looking at is to see if the overall market takes out that long-term pitchfork, then the banks can stay mired in mediocrity for years. And as far as I'm concerned, there's a chance they already have bottomed. Okay, other questions here. Is there a lot of significant numbers? So how do you know when you have the right one? And that's a common question that people ask. See, as I told you earlier in this presentation, we do not want to be a slave to numbers. Basically, what we are looking for is the right numbers to line up at support and resistance lines. So we want the numbers to be a tool as opposed to us being a slave to the numbers. Um, and let's see if the other question here is, pitchforks make a very good regression channel. What type of confluence do you determine if the price will extend? And basically, what we're, as I told you, I'm looking at the readings. The readings are giving me some kind of a feeling for if, the, if, that, if that regression line that you call it, or magnet line, what I call it, is going to be real support or resistance. Do you use all the important types of numbers to find turning points? Do you use some? Yeah, some numbers do work better than others. I find some of the stronger Fibonacci numbers and the GAN numbers do work better. Like if you're looking at a 161 reading or a 61 reading or a 261 reading or a 90 or 45 or a 360 reading, those are the strongest ones. Is there any other questions? I think that might be it. Shane says there might be one more. Okay, what type of timing technique would you use to determine a level of acceleration from one pitchfork line to such as in the banking index? You know what? Here's what, basically what we covered here. There's a third one that I didn't have time for, which is the square of nine. And basically what I'm using is that I'm using the square of nine, I'm using the ratio work, and I'm using the range and price square interchangeably, and if one of these appear at important support or resistance, I go with it. Let's see. I've tried counting the bars from low to low, from low to low, high to high, or low, blah, 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 and have difficulty matching the turning points. How does one achieve high probability turns based on period counts? Well, like I said, the, the theme, what, what we've done since you got my original book is that we've clustered this with important support and resistance lines. So what you guys want to do is you want to get really good at understanding where support and resistance is, and then what you want to do is take it one level deeper and look for the underlying structure of the markets. When these things line up, remember, three factors, support and resistance, Pitchfork or support, uh, uh, pitchfork, uh, uh, support or resistance, reading, and candlestick. Three components, not two out of three, three out of three. 
And the other question is, how do you reconcile these technical tools in light of the high-frequency statistical strategies which seen the dominant? I will tell you this. Here's what I'm going to tell you, is that Wall Street is in so much trouble, basically, because their models are uh, involved with linear math. When you're talking about statistics, you're talking about linear math. And to make a long story short, linear models will work so long in decent markets but when you linear math does not take into consideration uh, um, human emotion, and for human emotion, uh, we look at nonlinear math. We look at what I've showed you today, and you could go you could go for weeks or months and have things work, and you can lose your you can lose your life savings in one day if you don't account for human emotion. And that's all I'm going to say about that. You're welcome to share your closing thoughts and give yourself another plug. Okay. Here's the, here's the bottom line. I, I want to thank everybody for coming. We have more information available at Lucas Wave International. We have an excellent training program. If you don't want to do the training program, you can get the manual, and it covers everything that we did today. Plus, because I only had one hour, perhaps Shane will have me back someday and I can, uh, you know, we can, we can go on again. But what I, what, what I want to leave you with is the fact that if you want to put yourself in a position to win, you have to understand what a high probability setup looks like. And uh, remember, you understand the pattern. Pattern, people who don't understand the pattern make emotional mistakes. You make emotional mistakes, you bleed the bankroll. And uh, if you do understand the pattern, it's going to open up a lot of opportunities to you. And the bottom line is you want to put yourself in a position to win. And thank you all very much for coming. And on behalf of the Market Technicians Association, I'd like to personally thank Jeff for spending his time with us today and giving a spectacular presentation. Uh, for those of you who missed any part of this presentation or would like to rewatch it, we will have this presentation archived in the on-demand video archives and in the MTA knowledge base probably before the end of the week. If you have any additional questions that we could not answer today, just emails are listed on the screen, or you can contact a member of the MTA staff, and we'll be glad to pass your question along. I do encourage everyone to check out Jeff's website at Lucas Wave International, and if not sign up for his training program, at least sign up for his newsletter. Uh, on his site, it says he has a free newsletter offering, so I do encourage you to take advantage of that. Again, this webcast, We'll qualify you for one MTA continuing education credit, and if you registered online in the MTA shopping cart, it will automatically be added to your account. Thank you again for joining us, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.